who refused to have our country's stance on climate change and our engagement in the world be defined by the actions of one individual and one in administration. And it was evidence of the unique diversity of America, how power is distributed, how influence is distributed, and, and just the remarkable phenomenon of civil society, our private sector, and our local leaders in so many different levels who were still engaged, who still put together plans to make progress during four long years. And this coalition, America's still in, which is now morphed into a combination of America's Pledge and we're still in, is something that I am most excited about because it is evidence that even though we're right here in this COP where nations have come together to make commitments, it is also about the powerful voice and actions of subnational actors that interact with governments and at the same time need governments to set the table with powerful regulatory frameworks, a price on carbon, budgetary commitments, collaboration, and all the rest. So it gives me great joy today to introduce a uh, array of speakers that, um, that represent um, this effort. Oh, and by the way, I'm Carter Roberts. I am the president and CEO of WWF in the United States. We are immensely proud to be a part of this effort from the very beginning and on an ongoing basis and to support the voices and the actions of so many, along with an array of institutions, including Ceres and um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies, many, many others. Um, and, um, and this is just a wonderful moment and a great way to launch this pavilion. So I'm gonna introduce all of our speakers today. A couple of them will be virtual. Most of them will be here in person. And as I call their name, if you could come up, but, uh, and those of you who don't have the pleasure of being in Glasgow, if you could just appear on the screen and I'll ask you questions one by one. Um, first off, I wanted to introduce the Lieutenant Governor of California, Eleni Kunalakis. Um, um, Ms. Kunalakis is the 50th, 50th Lieutenant Governor of California, sworn in by Governor Gavin Newsom in 2019. She is the first woman elected to this position in the history of California. From 2010 to 2013, she also served as uh, President Barack Obama's uh, ambassador to Hungary, the first Greek American woman to serve as a US ambassador. And, uh, and in addition to her duties as Lieutenant Governor, she represents the state for international affairs and trade. Welcome, Lieutenant Governor. Also here with us on Zoom is Bob Holy Cross, Ford Motor Company's Vice President for Sustainability, Environment, and Safety Engineering. He is responsible for implementing sustainability best practices throughout the company and leading Ford's global environment and safety strategy policy and performance. Welcome, Mr. Holy Cross. It's great to be here. If you were wondering, he's the individual with, with the car uh, behind him. Uh, and uh, next, I want to welcome Council Member Kelly King. She holds the county council seat for the South Maui residency area in Hawaii. She is chair of the Climate Action, Resilience, and Environment Committee. She's dedicated many years of public service to her local community, as well as state, county organizations, and she brings her skills as a business owner to her office. Welcome, Ms. Kelly. And, um, and lastly, joining us on the screen, we're pleased to have Sally Slinker, the Executive Vice President, Chief Advocacy Officer at Common Spirit Health. She serves on the Executive Committee of the Healthcare Transformation Task Force and Chair of the Policy and Reimbursement Committee for the Catholic Health Association of the United States, touching on two really important issues in the whole climate change battle, the impact on people from health and also representing the faith-based communities. So um, welcome, Ms. Schlenker. Thank and, you so much. Um, 
And last but not least, um, Mr. Quinn Manson Bookwald. Mr. Bookwald is a member of the Mackinac bands of the Chippewa and Ottawa Indians. He serves as a policy specialist on environmental sustainability and natural resources with the National Congress of American Indians. Before that, he was a development advisor at the German Corporation for International Cooperation, focusing on supporting indigenous peoples of Indonesia on anti-corruption and deforestation projects. Welcome, Mr. Bookwald. So um, let me get started. And um, I think you can just tell from the diversity of this panel um, it is the diversity of America on display and the diversity of commitments to solving climate change. So I just want to start off with questions to the Lieutenant Governor. Um, California has long been on the vanguard of environment and climate policy in the U.S., creating what some call the California effect. As California acts, many institutions follow, expecting what California is going to do is going to be repeated elsewhere across the United States and elsewhere in the world. Together with the governors in the U.S. Climate Alliance, what policies are states taking that you think are going to be key in getting to the U.S. to our 2030 goals and beyond? Well, thank you so much, Carter. It's a great honor to be here and to be part of uh, the U.S. effort of uh, all in. California is most definitely all in and has been for a long time. And um, one of the things I think is so important is to understand where the authority comes from in our state to be able to be a leader on combating climate change. And it really goes back to the Clean Air Act in 1970 because ever since then we have had authority and growing authority through the courts to be able to control our emission standards in our state. And even most recently uh, in the last administration, when they attempted to take away our authority to control our emission standards, and we prevailed. And so um, when you uh, think about California, and some call us a nation state, well, the reality is California is a very, very proud part of the United States, but if there is one thing where we have something like sovereign power, it's on our emission standards. And we've put this to use over bipartisan governors, and of course, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, is, is extremely forward-leaning on this issue, as you know. Um, so when uh, it came to joining the incredible uh, coalition of states, uh, we were signed up on day one to stay in, all in, uh, with the Paris Climate Accord in California. We never missed a beat. Uh, and as I mentioned, we um, defended our authority to set emission standards. And I think this is important because um, what we've shown over these last four or five years now is that regardless of what may happen, California will continue to invest in and to set the policies for a clean energy future. Now, in terms of what I think is most important, I'll tell you, I think first is intention, uh, which I think that sort of answers that question there. But the, the, the second, um, you know, it's very important the transition to zero emission vehicles. In California, about half of our greenhouse gas emissions now come from uh, vehicles. So about 40% from cars themselves and about 10% from refining the oil to fuel those cars. So if we are going to be able to get to our 2045 goals of being uh, a carbon-free economy, carbon neutral economy, we have to deal with, um, with our transportation sector and personal uh, cars. So uh, the governor just uh, in the last uh, year has um, set a very ambitious goal that, not goal, but that the policy that by 2035, all new cars in the state of California must be zero emission vehicles. In order to get there, we're investing a record uh, investments right now about $3.9 billion out of this year's budget to go toward building the infrastructure for a ZEV future in our state. Uh, and it's great to see Bob from Ford here who was 
uh, telling us this morning about incredible things happening with, you know, an uh, electric uh, F-150 and all sorts of great things the private sector are doing to help us be able to get there. And then <clears throat> the final thing, just uh, very briefly, is scale. So anywhere you go in California, and again, we're, if we were a country, we would be the fifth largest economy in the world. We have 10 University of California campuses uh, with private universities, Cal State universities, research universities, everywhere, national laboratories, everywhere you go, young people are working on this. It is the moonshot. Uh, when you talk to young people, at least in, in my experience in, in higher education in our state. And we already have made great advances in wind and solar uh, electrification. Um, but in order to really accelerate deep decarbonization and invest in nature, as is written on the wall right here, we have to scale up. And so when you see $15 billion out of the California budget this year going into, uh, into climate resiliency and a clean energy fu future. A lot of that is going to have to do with finding the uh, innovative advances to be able to take what we've already learned, what we already can do, and scale it up so that countries, governments, industries around the world are able uh, to use uh, those uh, innovations in order to be able to make a massive difference, which is we know we need to stay under the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Awesome, awesome. Just uh, amazing the breadth and the scale of what you're doing there, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, California, always a wonder to behold the combination of technology, innovation, and also just political determination. I wanted to, you mentioned uh, Bob and Ford Motor Company and uh, uh, a number of um, uh, auto, uh, automakers in the United States have made some really big commitments about moving to electric vehicles. And I'd love to just ask Bob about that. Um, you made some exciting uh, news at, um, at Ford just this past year. And, um, and I'd love for you to just spend a bit of time telling us about that and the significance of that for Ford and the challenges you have in, in accomplishing that commitment and what that looks like in the years ahead. Well, great, Carter. Uh, thank you for, uh, for, for having us. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here in uh, Glasgow. Unfortunately, couldn't get into the Blue Zone today, but um, certainly uh, been enjoying um, the dialogue with all the, the key stakeholders here. You know, for Ford, it's it is what um, what the lieutenant governor mentioned, and it is about how we get to solutions um, at scale. So, there's three points I'd like to to highlight. The first is really how we start to match all these ambitions that those in the industry are taking and the aspirations they're setting, and get to the actions now. So we we talk a lot about things ten years from now, fifteen years from now, you know, around 2050, aligned with the Paris Agreement. But we have to start taking actions at scale now, which is something that's been a bit inconsistent in our industry. So saying you're for the Paris Climate Accord now when it's more politically convenient, that the, the, the time is over for that. The actions have to match the ambitions that folks are doing. And for Ford, we've been there from day one, including our partnership with California, which we're talk, I'll talk about in a minute. But on the product side and how we're making this revolution as a 120 year old company, this is the second revolution for us. The first was getting the world on wheels. We didn't invent the automobile, but we invented the mobility around high scale, large volume freedom of movement uh, through getting it to everybody. And that's what's gonna happen with this revolution on electrification. We are going to lead it at scale and we're going to do it by hitting our most iconic vehicles that resonate the most with consumers around the globe, like the Mustang Mach-E you see behind me, very worthy of the Mustang name, like the F-Series pickup franchise, where customers who demand all kinds of utility and performance from the products are going to see they can have all of that and zero emissions. It's also going to be about commercial fleet customers, not just retail customers. We have to do this across all transportation. As Lieutenant Governor mentioned, it goes across light duty and uh, commercial vehicles. And so our transit van franchise across the globe is going to be electrified as well, starting now. So it is about how we start to do this on our products because our scope three emissions are our largest contributor as was highlighted. The second point I wanna make is 
this also has to not just be about what we're doing, but how we're doing it. And for Ford and others in our industry, that means how we manufacture these products. Everything from how we power our facilities through the use of renewable net zero electricity, uh, the equipment that we're using in our facilities and the efficiency to get uh, the emissions down there. Um, how we have a true closed loop system by reusing materials. And when it comes to electrification, there are new challenges associated with the production of batteries, but there's also fantastic opportunities. And we're partnering with a number of organizations on how to reuse the scrap from battery materials during production. But then also when we take these batteries back at end of life, how we can use the materials out of them back in the process. It not only helps with uh, what we need to do from a sustainability perspective, but it also helps us secure a more uh, domestic uh, supply chain in the areas where we do business. So it is about uh, not just what we make, but how we make it. And then also what are the impacts truly on, on people in the communities that we do uh, business in? So with people, it's as much about the transition that's happening in our workforce and the skills that are needed to make these fantastic products and provide these services. Um, it is about the communities where we do business and the impacts it has there but also on society more as a whole. As we know, some of the biggest air quality challenges are in communities that are underserved, where a lot of vehicles operate on a regular basis are in areas that are, are underserved. So we have to get the benefits of these products to all uh, customers and in all communities. And that's where Ford makes a difference because we have the reach and the scale to be able to do this. And we're so excited about the opportunity. Finally, the third point I wanna make is around policy and how we work with governments. And you have to match your policy advocacy with your actions and your ambitions. And that has not been consistent in our industry. For Ford, we have been consistent. We need that consistency. So we have policies that are durable, that transcend political wins. We were proud to partner with the state of California over the last few years uh, during a more challenging time in policy in the US to voluntarily sign up to more aggressive greenhouse gas emission standards. We remain the only full line domestic automaker that has signed on to that agreement. And the great thing is, is that has served as a blueprint for the Biden administration's new vehicle greenhouse gas emission standards that should be finalized later this year. So the partnerships are key. We have to have policies that are durable and we have to have that transparency so that folks can see even where we haven't made the progress we hope necessarily in certain cases, people can hold us accountable and they can see the progress we make. So it has to be about the transparency as well as the partnerships. And we're just so excited to be on this journey and so glad to be at COP uh, these next two weeks to, to partner with everybody to get this done uh, once and for all. The time is now. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, um, I think what you're seeing is this symbiotic relationship between communities, between companies, and also the federal government and state governments and how that combination of innovation and policy frameworks is what creates a moment when you finally see the biggest automakers commit to 100% electrification, and that is groundbreaking in our country. I wanted to, um, I wanted to turn to Council Member Kelly Takaya King, and um, you know we've talked about local governments, we've talked about it at the scale of California, but um, when you think about coming out of Paris and the big part of getting the Paris Agreement done, eventually it comes down to the ground in real places like Hawaii. And I'd love if you could talk more about how for you, mayors and local elected, elected officials at the COP, um, why is it so important for the international, it, obviously it, we all know it's important for international leaders to listen to local communities. But what's your take on how that is happening this year in this COP that might be different from other years? We've had so many COPs over time. Thank you. Oh. I think on? you're on. Uh, am I on? Yes. OK. Thank you so much, Carter. And I'm really excited to be here because Maui has been all in since our last president pulled us out of the Paris Agreement. We, I immediately wrote a resolution to put Maui County back in. And we're thrilled to be at a point where in the last few years, we've been collaborating with local city, county, state, and even, um, even cross-country uh, experts. And it's, it's really important. And it's been so easy since the pandemic, as horrible as it's been to be locked down. 
um, this virtual technology has allowed us to bring people in just like that to to attend our, our committee meetings and our council meetings to update us on the latest information. But what we've really done is taken that information and enacted boots on the ground um, policies that are really making a difference. We just are working on policies now that are passing through our council to um, require all large homes, 5,000 square feet and over to be developed as net zero. And that's the first step. That, those are putting our toes in the water and we're gonna go from there. But we're also mapping out all of our uh, remaining wetlands because we've, in my district, we've gone from over 200 acres down to 24. And it's time to really put, make sure that we save what's left. This is our first defense against flooding. And our first defense against erosion is our coral reefs. And so we know how, and, and I know you know what's happening with the coral reefs. Um, but we just passed out of my committee the most ambitious um, sunscreen ban in the world. We are banning all chemical sunscreens, only allowing the two minerals, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, to be sold, distributed, or used on, in Maui County, if this goes through the council. So, you know, and this is really important for us because we're seeing coral bleaching, we're seeing algal blooms, we know our reefs are dying. Um, it's also related to what you, what you know, Hawaii Wildlife Fund has been involved in, and that's the Lahaina injection well case, which was the shot heard around the, the country. So I've been collaborating with ex-EPA officials, with environmentalists across the country, to to um, for the case that went to the Supreme Court, and I actually chaired the Council of the Year that we tried to keep it out of the Supreme Court. We tried to settle it on Maui, put the money into solutions rather than court cases. And unfortunately, we were at odds with our mayor who took it to the Supreme Court and thankfully lost, which was a big win for the people. And so aligning ourselves with the community and aligning the community with the right thing to do is really what, what makes it all the way to the top, what makes those policies at the top work. Uh, we also are working on some other things that we are, we know we're going to need the federal government's help. And one of those things is aviation emissions, is standardizing how we account for aviation emissions. So to, to this date, Hawaii has not counted international flights coming and going. We have not, uh, we've counted outgoing flights, but not incoming domestic flights. So there needs to be some standard standardization of how we account for those aviation emissions so we don't have omissions between one community and another, and we don't have um, doubling up. Um, but where, but those are those are issues that I'm hoping as a member. I'm really excited to be a member of the local government advisory committee for the EPA this year. And the EPA is thrilled. We're back on track. I, I want to share with everybody that the EPA is so excited to to reinvigorate the local government advisory committee, and they have said this is the most diverse local government advisory committee they've ever had. And we're ready for action. So from that, from that level to working with the National um, Association for County Organizations and, and hearing from President Biden that he sees uh, um, the counties and the cities as being the important tool to get these policies done. They can pass policies at even the state level and if we don't enforce them at the county level, then nothing happens. So getting that network across the country committed like you have and and you know just that taking anybody from the schools to the counties to the cities to you know NGOs um, taking their signature to say no we're all in that's what's going to carry us no matter what happens in the next election yeah which is a real a real fear and a real excitement for all of us in America thank you thanks so much um, um, wonderful story from Maui um, amazing place, and you're right. You can see it changing right in front of your eyes, and I'm, uh, it's so great that you guys are acting the way you are. We are, and you know, we had the, our state had the first, Hawaii, the state of Hawaii had the first uh, declaration of climate emergency of any of the states in the country, but Maui County did it two years before the state. Of, of course. So I'm really proud <laughs> of us. We, you know, and, and uh, the, the conversation with people saying, well, we should really discuss this in committee, you know, and, and the reaction of me telling them, when your house is on fire, you don't take a meeting, you grab a hose. Right. So that's where we're at. Everybody knows that's where we're at, at COP26. It's time to grab the hose right. and stop taking meetings. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. so much. Um, I, um, 
I, I wanted to move to Sh uh, Shelly Schlenker um, with Common Spirit Health. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We, um, we know that your CEO is, in fact, the co-chair, one of the co-chairs of uh, America's All In. And uh, we're so glad you could be with us here today. Um, I, I, as I said before, climate is, among many things, a health issue, a profoundly important health issue for people around the world. Can you expand on that a bit more and how it is interconnected with infrastructure, nature, and the many ways that we design policy changes, changes in our lifestyles to address climate change? Yes, thank you, Carter. And um, Lloyd Dean, our CEO, does send his greetings and congratulations. He is very proud to be a co-chair of America's All In. Um, we um, are so proud uh, to be able to announce, um, we announced yesterday, um, our new um, ambitious climate goal to take Common Spirit Health, our 140 hospitals and 1,000 care sites across 21 states to net zero by 2040. And um, as an interim step to go to cut in half our own greenhouse gas emissions from operations um, by 50% by 2030. To your point about um, how climate and health interact, um, the, as the largest system, we understand the unbreakable bond between people and the planet. Um, we know the tremendous impact our industry has on climate, as well as the effect of climate change on the patients we serve. We understand there's urgency in addressing climate change and are committed to delivering more sustainable health care. Um, when you, at the, it's very basic core, <laughs> a healthy planet means a healthy earth. And uh, uh, healthy earth means healthy people. And we have to address climate change in order to have healthy people. It takes clean water, clean air, nutritious food, and an infrastructure to support the health of individuals. Climate change is um, a threat multiplier um, for the drivers of social and economic justice issues around health. So we are working hard to not only address our emissions, um, but the broader um, supply chain issues and stakeholder issues. We're proud to advocate alongside uh, the governor in California uh, for landmark legislation there. Um, and we're doing everything to the point of, of Ford. We're installing the electric charging stations at all our hospitals and doing a lot uh, to move the needle. We understand that healthcare um, being about 10% of um, the total greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. must take action um, to make sure we have a healthy planet. Um, we um, have learned a lot of lessons during the pandemic, um, including how important infrastructure is. Um, and when you think about people having uh, clean water, clean housing, or safe housing, um, it is really important to look at the things we've learned in the pandemic. Um, in a period of a year, we scaled from a few thousand uh, virtual visits to a million and a half virtual visits uh, during the pandemic. And that took 15 metric tons um, of gas emissions out of the air and saved our patients $3.5 million. So when you look at President Biden's Build Back Better um, initiative, there are a lot of things in there that will really help us advance um, uh, health equity and how it impacts our patients. Climate change is really a health equity uh, issue. It impacts um, the, the vulnerable and people of color at a greater disparity than it does other populations. And our mission calls us to serve everyone with dignity, but especially those who are vulnerable and disenfranchised. Um, so we're um, very proud to be all in, um, in supporting uh, our nation in, re in meeting its uh, climate goals. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, we've heard from Eleni about the role of states. We've heard from 
Kelly about the importance of the voice of communities and we've heard from you about how climate change most particularly affects the lives of the most disadvantaged communities. And so I think it is fitting that we end with Quinn. Um, we, we had uh, yesterday a first session of America's All In, and we heard from Fawn Sharp, uh, who represented the Congress of American uh, Indians, and um, along with Sam. And we'd love to hear from you as a member of one of the First Nations in our country, just how you see the issue of climate change, how your voices are being heard in this COP, and what you, what you want to see from President Biden and the other leaders in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself as indigenous people. We introduce ourselves um, while entering a room. Buju, Mashkawide, Gwigwizens, Nishtakas, Makwa Ndodem, Michelle Makana and Dun Jaba. Achi everyone. My name is Quinn Manson Bookwald. I'm a member of the Mackinac Bands of Chippewa and Ottawa Indians and a, Turtle Mount and a descendant of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. I work at the National Congress of American Indians. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, it's really pointed at this time. Um, so NCEI represents tribal nations and governments across this country, um, and we advocate on behalf of these governments and their tribal citizens. Um, I think it's really important to talk about youth, and I don't think we can talk with, about climate action and climate change without talking about our future generations. Um, as, as we've seen at this COP, as well as in almost every other past COP, um, youth are an integral driving force to combat climate change. Indigenous youth are central to this activism, and indigenous perspectives have long been acknowledged um, among the youth movement uh, much longer than in some other institutions. Uh, for too long have the youth of our First Nations been the last consideration. Uh, especially, um, there's two points I'd like to make. One is we need to begin providing extra funding for youth to attend conferences and activities such as this, such as the COP. Uh, a lot of our youth come from communities and areas that are rural hard to access as well as they don't have the support, financial support to attend events. As well, we need to provide access, such as providing credentials to youth to attend COP. Um, I consider myself, a, I think I consider myself a youth, I'm 25, um, but I'm here today, I usually don't uh, speak, um, but all of our youth are indisposed because we don't have enough attending. Uh, additionally, for speaking about the Biden administration, uh, unfortunately, we saw the new reconciliation uh, package that is coming out, that just came out yesterday. Um, the House uh, bill that was proposed was $1 billion for climate action for tribal communities and uh, released yesterday. It's been cut by over half to $441 million, which is um, incredibly disappointing. Uh, we need to support our tribal communities, and I really hope that local communities as well as cities are able to help fill that gap through funding, capacity building, technical assistance. Um, one, that I really, one program I'd really like to mention is the Department of T Interior has recently announced an Indian Youth Service Corps, and we really need to push and ensure that federal funding is provided and allocated to this um, program. I think just to leave it with that, again, please focus on our youth, and I'd like to thank All In for really putting a priority on having youth and native voices at all of their events. I'd like to thank Ryan, uh, particularly. Um, and again, please um, think about our youth and how we can create better access for them in the future, since this is their future. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Okay, we, uh, I just got word that our last speaker is not going to make it, but I wanted to try something that no one has suggested that I do, but just riffing off of your last comment, um, one of the highlights of my day yesterday was talking to a group of college students and graduate students who were, were here at the COP um, from different places in the United States, and, um, and also Sam, who is a representative of uh, the indigenous community in Gamble, Alaska who I'm actually meeting with later this week. And, um, but I wondered if I could cold call 
somebody in the audience who is one of the college students who went to Swarthmore, now at Princeton University, and just, I'd love to get, you've heard all of the speakers, um, you've heard um, everyone reflect on the, the subnational programs, the commitments at different parts of our country, and also what's needed. And I'd love it if you could provide just some final reflections on what we've heard. See, this is gonna teach you never to come to a cop again um, on just what you've heard and, um, and any messages you'd like to share with the crowd. Oh my, okay. Sure, hi everyone. Over here? Yeah. Well, thank, thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, I'm Melissa Tier. I'm a PhD student at Princeton University in climate policy and that's worth more alum. Um, wow, this is incredible to be on stage, unexpected. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists for, for your comments. Um, I want to highlight what you were saying right at the end, of course, um, the involvement of youth activists, and particularly in indigenous youth activists um, from the US and for, from throughout the whole globe in, in participating in this event. Um, and they are in, they are participating both in these side events and formal events, but also in the broader stage here throughout COP, throughout Scotland. Um, that's just such an important uh, piece of this. Um, I actually had a question, but maybe I'll turn that into a reflection, um, which is that we've heard a lot about the emissions commitments that these different organizations and, and communities and local governments are making. I was a little bit surprised to not hear anything um, on the adaptation side um, of, of the climate crisis um, and the, the local communities and the industries that are represented here today are already facing um, the effects of extreme weather events and they will continue to um, and our lives will continue to be disrupted. Um, so I think both the sides of that coin are critically important um, to work with the new administration and to work with this coalition um, on meeting both you know, how we achieve the emissions reduction pathway and how we also um, adopt to the, the world that we're living in now and in the future. Thanks so much. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I, um, let me let the Lieutenant Governor uh, address that issue. I agree, change is already upon us, communities are already suffering and nations are suffering. And we're, we've, we've started to hear some big commitments from governments here today. Uh, it's just the beginning, I think, but I'd love to hear from the Lieutenant Governor well, and also from Quinn. Oh, I think everyone's going to come in know, on that, this. That is a very, very important thing to highlight. And in California, we have been experiencing this disproportionately. Uh, the experts estimate that we have lost about 150 million trees over the last 10 years in the largest forest die-off uh, in the history, recorded history of our state. Uh, pine bark beetle infestations have come from weakened forests, uh, drought, uh, and uh, changes in the temperatures in the winter time. Um, we have had four last year, four of the five largest wildfires, most catastrophic wildfires in the history of our state just last year alone when 4% of the state burned that had to do with dry lightning strikes, something that was not unheard of, but that came full force and uh, without any notion that such a thing could happen. And these uh, fires ignited across the state in, the state in these massive fire complexes. Uh, we have had high winds um, now that are common, whereas um, they would only really occur in certain parts of the state at certain parts of the year. Now they're everywhere. We don't even think of fire season anymore. We just think of fires anytime um, because of the changes that have been brought on by climate change. So we are already having to adapt uh, to the impacts. Um, but the very first thing that we talked about was um, the intention and uh, the people of the state of California who are now living in these um, extreme situations and these natural disasters. In fact, one of the members of our delegation from California is our insurance commissioner. Californians across the state can't get insurance anymore. So there is a lot that's happening um, and without a doubt this combination of adaptation uh, as well as um, 
being more driven than ever to do what we can uh, and what we must in order to be able to bring down emissions. And let me maybe just say one other thing, which is that California is 27% foreign born. We are 27% immigrants. The national average is 14%. We are the number one destination for immigrants into the United States. We welcome our diversity. We see it as our strength. Uh, but there is no question is that as the climate changes in the world, immigration into the United States will be impacted, immigration to California as well. So we are feeling this on absolutely uh, every possible level, uh, which is why we are always going to be the first at the table uh, to continue in this effort to uh, allow for human activity to be the answer and no longer just the cause. Great, thank you. Uh, let me turn to Quinn and then I'll give Kelly the last word. Thank you and thank you for your comments. Um, I think it's really important, or it is really important for tribal nations to be at the table. Uh, as my great grandmother always told my dad and I, uh, if you're not on the table, you're on the menu. Um, so uh, tribal nations really are on the front lines of climate change uh, across Alaska, Washington State, to Louisiana. We've already started or have already completed relocation efforts of tribal communities. Um, and of course, federal funding is incredibly important, but I also want to stress the importance of having tribal perspectives, indigenous perspectives to climate change, listening to those ideas. Um, we've managed these lands for millennia. Um, so having those people at the table listen to those solutions um, is incredibly important and it's um, incredibly exciting to see that, that move in the last um, year or so. So thank you very much. Great, thanks. Kelly? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that question because uh, I think there's two points to that. There's adaptation to uh, environmentally to what we're doing and we are certainly in Hawaii adapting the way we do energy we're going more into community-based energy that also gives us jobs and keeps the local revenue in um, and and that's one of the things I wanted to highlight earlier too is the fact that it's important to also keep the focus on agriculture but it's not agriculture for agriculture's sake how you do agriculture is as important as what you farm you ha we have to start doing agriculture regeneratively so that we're also capturing the carbon. Um, but I think what you're really talking about is how do we ad adapt to the changes that are happening um, from climate change? And this is something that is, is exciting you're bringing up because I've been talking about this for the last couple of years that the people who are going to survive are the people who are going to be able to pivot and adapt. We have to be flexible. We can't be expecting every time we flip a switch, the lights are gonna come on, because sometimes they aren't. We, we, we can't be expecting that every time we want a drink of water, that the water's gonna flow, because it's not. And so conservation is a big part of the ad adaptation. But it's also in our minds. We're gonna have to go back to the days where we didn't have everything we needed at, at our fingertips. And, things are, and, and we're not in a disposable world anymore. We know that. That's, we can't afford to, to uh, trash our, your future environment. So that's what it's gonna take, is it's gonna take all these communities telling our people to, have, uh, to be flexible and, and think of life differently. You know, we need, to, we need to think in terms of all of us making a living instead of a few of us making a killing. That's really what's, what's driving the whole anti-climate change action, is the idea of the big corporations wanting to keep making those big r revenue streams. And what we need to do is get it down to the community level. So that's what we're trying to do. That's my big push in Hawaii, is getting it to community-based. Working, we're working with ICLE on a circular economy model so that um, the local people benefit. There's more benefit in our community, less extraction, which for us would mean a lot less tourism. And we focus on having a good life, having a great life, but not worrying about having the creature comforts every time we need them. I, the, to me, that's the best way we're gonna adapt to the future after, cl as climate change keeps happening. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for the question. I, uh, I wanted I to close, I'm, I'm sorry? Um, I wanted to close oh, by I just- Oh, I was just going to add. Shelly? Shelly? Sorry, there's a delay. 
I, I just wanted to um, echo that last um, dialogue that healthcare is on the front lines of adapting and responding to these climate emergencies because we're seeing the increased asthma from air pollution from fires and um, treating patients with extreme heat exposure. And we are that sort of last line of defense for those patients who have nowhere else to turn in extreme climate events. And so we too are doing our part to sort of adapt and do new drills and reach out into our communities um, so that the patients we serve get the care they need um, in these catastrophic events. And, and we are seeing them multiply across all of our 21 states. And um, unfortunately, it's also the health equity issue because those patients we're seeing are the, the poor, the vulnerable, and, and the communities of color. And COVID really highlighted that. Um, you know, those were the um, communities most impacted. And if you already have respiratory diseases, uh, the, the outcomes are more severe. So um, we too have been um, looking at that adaptation and how we change, how we provide care uh, to better need, meet the needs of our communities. With um, apologies to Bob, I just got the sign that I need to close. Um, and um, um, I'm sure you would have something to say about adaptation too. I, um, I wanted to thank all of you, our panelists, for participating. It was great to hear your stories, all of you, your different perspectives that represents the diversity of where we're all in. And, um, and, and I wanted to thank all of you for staying till the bitter end. Um, for me, this whole question, I love the idea of learning to pivot. And I also know that there is a profound, profoundly important role of our government, policymakers, and how they set policy and also how they set budgets to enable communities to pivot more than they can now. And, um, and so I, it's a great note to end on. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us. And um, we'll see you around the conference. <laughs>